Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Bob Henrit, who is a legendary drummer, a writer, and most recently the producer of the awesome documentary on Netflix, Count Me In. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you've been on my list for quite some time, um, and I'm, I'm very, very happy to get you on here. Um, and, and I just found out as we were talking, you told me, oh, I, I saw you in the Count Me In documentary, and I didn't really realize your serious involvement. I mean, it's your documentary. I, I just have to say right off the bat that I loved it, and I know many people listening um, really enjoyed it on Netflix. Great. Well, it's been in the works, believe it or not, for 27 years. Oh, my God. So when I first joined the Kinks, I was working on it, and then it, it went away. It was a different film because, of course, it was 27 years ago, so a lot of people who could have been in it are no longer around mm -hmm. to be in it. But uh, it, it's, it's a labor of love, and a bit like writing a book, as you probably know. You know, the reason for writing a book is you want people to know what you are up to, especially your children, because yeah. there I was uh, touring America incessantly with whatever band, and uh, my kids didn't see me, so the uh, so I wrote uh, my my biography or my autobiography, should I say? Yeah. Because I wanted the kids to know where I was, you know, for, for all those years. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. I was just thinking about that the other day. I was like, you don't think about it sometimes, but you know, I have a son, and, and it's like, you know, these. I thought about with these podcasts. It's like a hundred plus hours now of me talking about drums that in in 50 years <laughs> yeah. he can listen to i don't know if he will, he'll want to but it's uh i i totally get you on that um so we'll maybe talk about more in depth on in uh about count me in later sure. um or maybe in the bonus episode depending on time but uh just to just tell everyone if you haven't seen it look on netflix and it is um it's done right. I remember watching it and talking about it on social media, and it's just it's it hit the nail on the head. It feels exactly like it should um, for a drum documentary. So before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to Maddie Roberts, um, who actually got me connected with you. And uh, oh, yeah. you've done an interview with him, and he does the percussion discussion YouTube interviews which you did one with him i believe and uh he's in mm. wales i think so he got us connected and um just a big thank you to maddie for for doing that yeah so all right bob what we're here to talk about today and you are quite the writer my friend i mean i've you sent me some amazing um just articles and you could just whip out a great uh <laughs> article kind of at will so one thing you sent over that I you I had some options and um, with a guy like you you're without a doubt I hope to have you before we even start back on the show to do more down the road but our topic today is desert island drums um, and for people who don't maybe know what that term refers to it's like the old saying like you're on a desert island what's your top three albums you take or what's your top three things you take probably water and food <laughs> for most people but. <laughs> But we're talking about drums. So what would be your drums that you have to have? Because for a guy like you who has, you've had a lot of drums. Um, so what are your Desert Island drums? Go, go, go as in-depth as you can. Well, Lance Armstrong hit it on the head when he, he had a book out called um, It's Not About the Bike. Now, it's, that's, uh, that pre preceded everything that happened with him, but... <laughs> You know, there are there are fantastic drums that don't work in certain situations. And there are awful drums, you know, things that uh, are built in in Taiwan or wherever, built somewhere. And they aren't expensive. They aren't uh, at all special, but they work in the studio. So um, I, I, I began with... Uh, it was a super sensitive. It was a Ludwig super sensitive. I'll start from the beginning. Yeah. And so this would be my number one hit, if you see what I mean. So it sure. started I, in 1962. I was touring Ireland uh, with uh, a rock and roll singer. And we were going, in those days, Ireland was full of ballrooms because people danced. And they had show bands, which were really dance bands. And uh, so we would go over there every now and again. So cut to the chase. I am in Dublin and I'm walking around 
uh, Dublin, and I came uh, I came upon a music shop. It was actually a record shop, but I came upon it and I went in, and there on the counter was a Ludwig Super Sensitive. Hmm. Now this was 1962, as I said, and we couldn't get American things in in England just after the war, which is ostensibly what this was. You couldn't you couldn't buy Fender guitars easily. You couldn't get Zildjian cymbals, and you definitely couldn't get Ludwig drums. So I seized the moment and bought the drum hmm. for fifty or the equivalent of fifty pounds, and I then had to get it home. Now if I if I declared it. I would have been paying a great deal more for tax and duty. So I worked out a way of we, – we were going from from Dublin to Northern Ireland across the border, and I had the drum underneath the seat. And uh, I we, – we, we were searched by uh, the, the uh, customs people who discovered that I had a watch on. <laughs> now, underneath me is a, is a drum – and this watch, which, which I probably paid two or three pounds for, took the customs guy's attention. And he looked at it and he said, is that new? And I said, yeah, but I only paid two quid for it. So he, they confiscated it, but they didn't see the drum under the seat. We, we went into, into uh, Northern Ireland, which was part of Britain, and I could then legally put the drum in the post back to England. So this was 61. And I used it for everything. It was, uh, interestingly enough, but I didn't know what it was. I, I didn't know much about it because we were, we were bereft. We weren't able to see Ludwig stuff because it wasn't allowed in the country unless you smuggled it in. Mm. So um, mm. I used it for everything. I used it for concrete and clay. I used it for well, just about everything. And in the end, I used it for hold your head up and God gave rock and roll to you. And it was my... I think you'd call it my go-to drum, and got it home, used it for ages and ages, and it was it was showing where I it was it was such a wonderful drum. But I, I eventually found out its provenance, and we went to America first Argent tour, 1970, and I thought I had that drum with me, and I thought this is just the right time to take it back to Ludwig in Chicago. And and get it fettled, get it looked at. So I took it to Damon North Damon Avenue, handed it over to the to the. They had a guy who whose job was to 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 resurrect things really. Hmm. And yeah. and interestingly enough, he also tuned up snare drums before they were put in their boxes and sent out to whoever had bought them. So that was he had a proper job. And so the next thing that I knew is the guy was telling me about a certain amount of. Uh, of super sensitives which were made in brass. Now, I didn't know anything about that and didn't think mine could possibly be that because why would it be? So there were 12 of them made and he took mine away and he came back. He said, I've got some good news for you. He said, this is one of the 12. Hmm. And he said, thanks for bringing it in because I've never seen one of these. Wow. So there I am with a brass super sensitive, Jeez. which, as I said, I used for everything. Uh, took we, I took the drum home and opened the drum shop and put my drum shop, Henry's Drum Store, and put the uh, the drum in not exactly in the window, but it was around. It wasn't. I was I, I was really hoping nobody was going to sell it, and I went off with Don McLean. So months later, I came back and they said, "Good news! Uh, a German drum uh, shop owner came in." and bought everything. I said, what, everything? Yeah, it's all gone. I said, what about my snare drum? He said, well, he, he took that. Oh. So in Germany somewhere, years and years after the event, is a real rare bird. And uh, so that's the story of my, that, that is my favorite uh, drum. How does a drum like that end up in Dublin? You have to wonder. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, that's a rare yeah, well, Im import. I, I hear what I hear what you're saying, Bart, and I had exactly the same um, thoughts. But and so, guess what? I asked the guy in Ludwig. I said, "How did this find its way?" He said, "He, he said I don't know." <laughs> and they then told me the story of the export department at Ludwig, which was an atlas on the wall, or rather in a bookcase. And if they if they had to send a drum to um, 
any country, they would look it up and work out whether they could send it. Mm. That, and that, that was their export department at one time. So they, they looked at an atlas of the world and thought, yeah, we could send it there. <laughs> so he anyway, cut to the chase again. He couldn't tell me how it got found its way to Ireland, but he was very pleased to see it. And yeah. uh, I had a jolly nice time when I was in in Chicago. I, you know, I met I met Bill, I met Billy, I met I met old Bill, I met old William, perhaps I should call him, and Billy, sure. Billy too. And then I met uh, young young Bill. <laughs> All the Bills. Yeah, lots of Bills in the yeah. Well, WFL was a Bill, of course. Of course. Anyway, so I was was doing the Chicago drum fair, and I was booked by um, Rob Cook to talk on the subject of the British invasion, which is something that I, I know lots about. So I, I found my way to Chicago and did my shtick, did my talk, and I then started to sign my book, Banging On. And so there's a long queue of people, well, a reasonable long queue, and one of the guys came up to me and said, and I talked about the acrylite that I'd had, that's right. And he said, so have you still got that acrylite? I said, no, somebody stole it. He said, oh, bummer. Uh, so he w- I signed his book. He went off. And a little, a few minutes later, I saw him back in the queue. And he had something behind his back. And he, he came up. I said, have you got another book to sign? He said, no, I've got something for you. And he produced a drum from behind his back, which was, guess what, an acrylite. Mm. He said, I decided that I can afford it, so I've bought this for you. I said, oh, that's fantastic. I said, and I said, you're, you're very kind. He said, I just think you should have one. So that that arrived. I now had another acrylite. And I was a little bit embarrassed, Bart, but not, not, not really embarrassed. But a, a few years earlier, um, I'd been doing a gig with, uh, with Keith Moon. So at the, Mo- the Who and I guess it were our, oh, it might have been uh, the Kinks. Anyway, we were doing a gig in Rotterdam. And Mooney tried to give me one of his snare drums. And this was, he had special snare drums, which were, they were made by Gretsch. They were walnut and they, they, they looked fantastic. And they were, they had a silver plate on them and they, it said DRB special. And another thing, like, I don't, I couldn't find out how the, the, the super sensitive found its way to Ireland. And I certainly couldn't find out who DRB was. And I assumed it was something to do with Frank Ippolito uh, in, in, in New York. Mm-hmm. And somebody had made, had breathed on it and made this somebody whose initials were presumably DRB. Anyway, uh, Mooney had tried to give me one. And I said, oh, Keith, I can't take it. And I've been embarrassed. Uh, I was embarrassed at the time. And I've been kicking myself ever since. And, of course, that, that, that particular drum is it's somewhere, and, uh, but it, I, it's not mine, which is a, a great shame. Mm. And I would love yeah. to have had it. The guy came up with the acrylite, so I now have another acrylite, which is, uh, which is rather good. That's amazing. And did, you never found out who DRB is, right? No. Like, you know what? I've had emails by the hundred. Who is DRB? And I don't know. And I've I've thought of everybody I know in drums uh, in America, especially in New York, and it doesn't make doesn't make any sense. So nobody knows. It obviously just like how the drum end up in Dublin. It's just I feel like it. Someone took it there, or and some guy named Dave or whatever wrote his initials. Well, on yeah, drum. yeah. There, there doesn't need well, to be some crazy story, I guess. You know. Well, you, but the, on the other hand, it, it's a great story, and if we perhaps if we knew the answer, then it wouldn't be quite such a great story. True, true. It's the mystery that uh, that we that we love about these drums. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so, uh, so you're on an island, and that's one of your drums with you there. Um, yeah. What what do you, what else would you you take on your okay. island? I was doing a gig uh, in where the heck was it? Oh, in Austin. We were in Austin doing an Argent gig, and we were playing at the, what do we call it, the Armadillo, and uh, I was walking around. Uh, I, I've, I've 
I actually take my life in my hands sometimes and I'll walk around places that I shouldn't be. You know, with the, the mindset is, well, I'm, I'm a musician. Nobody's going to attack me, which, of course, is a big mistake. Yeah. So anyway, um, I came upon a garage sale and I'm in a pretty dodgy. I then realized I was walking in of not the greatest part of, of the city. And when I thought it was a garage sale, I might as well have a look what they've got. And they, they had two drums. One was in really beaten up, and the other was a WFL marching drum. Nice. So I said to the guy, how much is the, the marching drum? And he said, you can have it for $5. I said, oh, okay, I'll take it. So And I managed to take bring it in to, to England without paying any duty because I, for, I owned up and told the customs guy, listen, I paid $5 for this, that's all. And he said, well, if somebody's daft enough to sell it to you for $5, <laughs> then we can't possibly char- charge you any duty on it. That's awesome. So that, that I would take that because um, it was a marching drum, and if I had to signal to a ship, I, I could probably do it with do, uh, SOS, dot, 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 <laughs> dash, 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 I, and, and dot, dot, dot. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was another one. And I also thought if, if I can't make the ship stop, by playing the drum, maybe I could set fire to it. So, <laughs> and, and they'll see the smoke. So that was my rationale. Yeah. So that was another one that came along. That's awesome, and, man. I love that you're so, walking around. I, it's so cool to me that you are, I mean, you're a, you're a famous rock drummer. I mean, you're, you're going around the world playing and you're, you're interested in walking around, looking at garage sales, trying to find drums, which all of us are. I mean, I don't think there's a day that goes by where if I'm in the car and I see a garage sale out the window where I'm just not completely turned around. Obviously, let's say my wife is driving or something. I'm completely turned around going, are <laughs> yeah, there yeah. drums there? <laughs> or or yeah. stop in at like a, like a thrift shop. Uh, that's You can't take that out of the drummer, the hunt. I, like I must say, uh, Bart, I, 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 I would rationalize it, when I was buying another drum set, especially in America, you know, that this would be what one of the kids would like. You know, the kids weren't old enough to have a drum kit, but <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm going with. Oh, and yeah. then in the end, we had so many drums, I used to say, this is what my wife would want. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I would justify it. Yeah. But to, to talk that one through, we were playing with the Kinks in Binghamton. And Binghamton is SUNY, as in State University of New York. Yeah. We were doing a gig in a, uh, in the, I guess it was in the, in the gym, and I was walking around as as we said, and I found a mum and pop music shop. So I went in, and the the guy behind the counter said, "Yeah, can I help you?" I said, "I'm looking for drums." He said, "Well, what we've got is downstairs." So he said, "Help yourself." So I went downstairs, and there mm. was a Ringo set. Mm. It was exactly right. It was uh, it was black oyster, and it it was it was exactly the right sizes. And the I, I looked it over and discovered that it didn't. Have, the only thing it didn't have was the front hoop. So I went back upstairs and said, uh, I, I, li- "I like the look of that grey kit, you know, that sort of thing." And the guy said, "Oh, the Ringo." I said, "Yes, that's right, the Ringo kit." And he said, "He said, well, it's for sale. Do you want it?" I said, "How much is it?" And he said, uh, well, you make me an offer. So, And, and he knew I was in the kinks because there are not too many Englishmen uh, wandering around uh, Binghamton. <laughs> and, the, and the kinks were in town doing the, the gig. So um, I, 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 I didn't want to make myself look stupid, but I said, I'll give you 50. He said, done. So there I am buying a Ringo kit for $50. Wow. And uh, so he said, I'll put it in a box for you. And uh, he did, and the uh, the road crew came and picked it up, and it joined uh, everything going home from America, and, and that was that. Except when I left, oh, he said, he said you can have it for fifty, providing I can scalp some tickets. Mm. He said, fair enough. How many yeah. do you need? He said, you wanted a couple. So I said, good. And then on my way out, he took me aside. He said, you know, you could have got it for a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you didn't try hard enough. <laughs> Yeah, but you're, you know, you're the like the rock oh, drummer in yeah. town. There's a little bit of that, like, you don't want to be like 
stories would spread like he he offered me five bucks for a Ringo set. You know, you I think you you got obviously you got a killer deal. Um, but oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and the interesting thing is the next shop I went into, which was the next day, was a proper drum shop. And uh, and they had one. They had a hoop. And there was the hoop that I needed, which I thought well, I'm never, ever going to find. Yeah. And and so I bought it. And guess how much it cost? I don't know, fifty dollars. <laughs> Ex- exactly. Wow. Oh, geez. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. No, no. Oh my gosh. I mean, that the fact that he knew it was a Ringo kit, but oh, wrong, wrong. Yeah. I mean, then you'd think he'd know the value of it, but I mean, all right. So ob- obviously, we all know this is pre-internet, but I feel like the internet really kind well, of kicked- had it. Yeah, had it not been a mom and pop shop, I, I then. Of course, it wouldn't have been $50, that's for sure. What would that have typically... Co- what year was that again? Oh, sugar. I, I, I was in the Kings. I, 84, 85. What would that set... So people know. I mean, it, this is like... This is not... I don't know. I mean, I, f- I feel like values go up and down, but what would you as a collector have you know, in a normal shop? Or if you were going to sell that drum set in 84... 85 what would you have sold that drum set at as a re- at a retail shop cost wise oh yeah at least a grand wow wow in in 84 yeah man that's uh you got that is like that's the the hunt that that gets us all so excited is that find of like i always equate it to like opening a hat box at a garage oh, yeah. sale and finding like a black beauty in it or something, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow, that's so. But, cool. I mean, the interesting. I mean, we drummers, we like that. That's what we do, and we talk to one another about it. I don't think other instrumentalists, that you know, who I'm talking about, have quite the same mindset. I'm guessing, and I'm, I'm guessing that you and I, if we wanted to debate the merits of a a screw or a nut and bolt or no pun, pun intended, by the way, a <laughs> nut and bolt, we would, and we could. Yeah. And we could probably sit down and talk about a Gretsch throw off for half an hour. If we, <laughs> if we, if we, if we wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just the beauty of it. And I've had that at, at, I mean, really at the Chicago drum show and some of these other shows where you just have the, and if, if, if I don't know something, or if I'm just talking to someone else who might not know a certain history thing that, that somehow I know and they don't, um, it's the beauty of like, like I can talk to you, one of the most, uh, you know, acclaimed collectors and drummers in the world. And we're just having a good time. There's no, I like that with drummers, there's never any talking down or you don't know that, which I don't think other well, instruments well, yeah, do that, right. but. It's not us, is it? It's not our thing, man. No, no, we wanna we wanna teach it and um and and spread it on. So um all right, so while we're talking about this, I just think it's so cool too that you're just collecting these drums while you're while you're on the road. Did you ever have a limit that was like they're like, Bob, okay, stop. We can't take any more drums back with us. Or were did you kind of have freedom well, no it, 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 you'd think that it would have happened but it never did but i mean I, there was I, I am sensible and you know I, I i always felt that one was enough and that was the reason why i went into frank ippolito's in new york and there was the camco and the, i'll describe it it was in red lacquer with gold fittings and red evans heads on it see-through I mean, it was just fantastic. Hmm. And my, my MX card was burning a hole in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, I thought, I should buy this. And in the end, I, I, back to what you were saying, I'd already bought one that tour. So I thought, I think I'm, coming, I'm getting close to the edge here. So <laughs> I'll pass on this one. And, the, another, and so, the, of course, uh, as, as we know, there's always one that gets away. And uh, yeah. I was in Frank Ippolito's and – didn't buy that, but the next time I, I was in a, a shop in Kansas City, Kansas, and it mm. was Explorers was the drum shop. Uh, I, I went into Explorers, and uh, I think the guy's name was Gary Boyle, uh, which was the same name as a, a guitarist in England, and we chatted, and he immediately started talking about Heyman drums. I said, I'm surprised that you know anything about Heyman drums, because Heyman drums were – 
predicated on, on Camco or more specifically on George Way drums. Sure, the you turret know, the, lug. The, the, with the round casings and everything. So anyway, I said, so, so having spoken about Heyman, I discovered an acrylite. And it was like no acrylite I'd ever seen before. And it, instead of having um, a 45-degree flange inside, it actually had a rollover flange. And there were great plates behind the nut boxes. It, so there were plates inside which held the nut boxes on. And I, I, I just didn't get it because I, I just didn't understand the drum. And, of course, the reason I didn't understand it, it was very, very early. It had an inter, interim uh, badge on it, Keystone. And uh, I, I passed on it. Of course, that's one that I shouldn't have passed on. But, you know, it's, that's the way it goes. But uh, So I didn't yeah. buy that. And now I've got another one. And uh, that's it, really. You'll remember that for the rest of your life. Basically, yeah. these, these drums you just missed, you know? Yeah. But so I've got another story about St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of the, the guy, but he had... He didn't have a, a drum shop. He had a drum house. So we were playing in St. Louis. So having gone up the arch and thought, what am I going to do now? I took a cab out to this guy's drum shop, which turned out to be so far away that I began to get scared. Yeah. I thought, I'm not going to be buying any drums here because it's all going to go in a cab fare. So I negotiated with the cabbie. Uh, how much is it going to be round trip? And uh, he, he told me. So I went into the drum house, and may I never get off this bike. There were drums up and down the stairs. There were drums in the kitchen. There were drums in, in the bedrooms. And I'm walking around somebody's house wow. where all these drums are. And at the time, I was there looking for a radio king, and I just didn't like the look of the one that they had. So I said, I'm going to pass. Anyway, we, I got the cab back to the hotel. And the guy who who owned the, the drum house called and said, "What did you think?" I said, "I was I was very pleased to see your sh your shop, but um, you didn't have what I'm looking for." And and he said, "Didn't you see any duplex?" I said, "And I I, I didn't know much about duplex, so I said, well, I, no, I I know you had a duplex, but I don't know anything about them. And they they I mean it's called the Spirit of St. Louis." And that's because that's where uh, that's where the flight began across the Atlantic with Lindbergh. Uh, anyway, we um, he said, you know, you really should buy one of these duplex. I said, well, how much is it going to be? And he said, because I would by then be buying it sight unseen. And he said, well, you can have it for one and a quarter. Mm. And I thought. I immediately, actually, I think he said two and a quarter. And I said, well, the problem is at two and a quarter, I'll be paying a lot of duty on it and it won't work for me. Uh, you know, I said 2,500 or whatever is, is more money than I, I want to pay for it and uh, pay the duty on. He said, no, 250. It was 250. Wow. So I said, I've got to buy it. So I bought it, brought it home, and uh, eventually – I had, I don't know if I told you, I had um, 35 drum kits up in my loft in my old house, and I thought the roof was going to fall in, uh, and there were 55 snare drums that weren't, so I had more drums than you could shake a stick at, Jeez. unintended. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so I, I bought that one back home, and eventually I decided I had too many drums uh, and I should get rid of them. So I got a drum uh, buyer around. He bought them, and they. I, I felt selfish, to tell you the truth. And I thought, I've got too many bloody drums here. Nobody's seeing them because there's, there's so many, you can't get up into the loft. And eventually, uh, Lou Dias came from Supreme Drums, came around, bought them all, and, and they were off my hands. But interestingly enough, uh, Every time I go to a trade show, to a, you know, a, a, tra a, a fair, you know, like the, uh, the one in Chicago, I see something that I once owned. Hmm. So it, it's, it's found its way back into the food chain, as it were. <laughs>
<laughs> that has to be a funny feeling that you've collected so many drums that you go somewhere and it's like your children. They've spread around the world and they're, they're now in yeah. different drum shops. It's like collateral. I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, I'm, there's a drum fair coming up next month or the month after uh, in Coventry to which I am going and I'll see some of the stuff there. And I mean, Alan Buckley, who you may have heard of, some of my stuff found its way to Alan. He's known as Sir Alan Buckley. Hmm. And he has all of his drums in an outhouse, an outbuilding, and he can't get through get in the door because there's too many bloody drums in there. Hmm. So so that's even worse than me. But at least um, at least his ceiling's not gonna fall down. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I've had uh, like Mike Corrado on the show who has 650 snare drums and stuff. And I mean, there's um, I think we all think, man, that's awesome. We don't think like, wow, this guy, this guy has a problem. He needs help. No, we think, man, what a lucky guy to walk through his house and, and have all these drums. But I think it's it's just fun to collect them and sell them and buy them. Do you typically just. You sound like you you go both ways, where you you call, you you buy and you sell. I know there's a lot of people who just buy. Well, between us, you know, there is there is a fine line um, with having too much. I I think because there's the selfishness of it comes into it, and I, I would frankly rather that these things were were out there uh, in in the wide world. I, I could never subscribe to that whole thing where. James Bond goes into somewhere into a guy's museum in uh, somewhere in Japan, and he discovers all these stolen paintings on the wall. And uh, I could never subscribe to that because mm-hmm. nobody's seeing them. So uh, for me, it's the sharing that counts. Yeah, that's that's a great point. It's like I think there was a story of a guy who way back in, you know, in, in history, stole the Mona Lisa. And I think it was hiding under his mattress. He was like a janitor who stole the Mona Lisa. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. like, yeah, these things are meant to be seen. Um, That's but, why they were painted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I get, though, the, 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 the desire to, to buy them. It's like you get a it's like getting a new snare drum. For me, it's like I get this like rush of like, yes, I got it. And then, you know, a month later, I still play it. But you need another one. You're looking, <laughs> you're on to the next one, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, there is a certain element of drinking it in, if you see what I mean. Sure. Uh, and interestingly enough, not as, as we said right at the beginning, not all drums sound great. Just because it's, um, it's old. Uh, I mean, when, we first, when I first went to America, nobody was collecting drums. They were collecting guitars, but they weren't collecting drums. And this was the... This was the late 60s, and it, they were just old drums, and people wanted new and shiny and, and groovy, man. And uh, they, they weren't interested in something that was old. They, they wanted a new thing, a new shiny thing, you know, sure. like, like their shiny bike and everything. Hmm. Yeah. You know, okay, and so – I agree completely. I mean, that's that that seems to be the sentiment with a lot of these episodes is it was before my time, but collectors would say, oh, man, you could get Ludwig's in the you know late 80s, early 90s for nothing. And they all wish that they bought them up. Um, yeah. But, you know, so. All right. I'm looking back at what you sent over here, just at some some more of the desert island stories. Um, yeah. So I see one here that. Uh, what is it? Fipos? Explain yeah, that. OK. Um Okay, uh, it's got the SH1T word in it at the end, and it's a far eastern piece of SH1T. So they're known as FIPOS. And uh, so, and and what, why I wrote it in is that um, I had the cheapest possible uh, drum, which I, I'd seen being made in the middle of a paddy field in Taiwan when I was there. And what happens is that the children come home from school. They, they have their food and they then go into the factory and work making drums or snap on tools or, or whatever they're, whatever they're asked to make. Sure. So, um, but so it just goes to show is that these things are just put together, you know, they're, they're, they're not, there's no real, uh, expertise. They're just nuts and bolts. And, uh, for some reason they sound good. Yeah. Rather in the way that an acrylite 
sounds good. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would agree completely. I've, I've had a handful of like the Japanese sets from, you know, the seventies or sixties and, and I, I like them. And I think the snare drums hold a special, uh, place in people's hearts, like the Apollos and the stars and all that. Yeah. And yeah. There's something about well, that poplar kind of wood. That's, um, you know, very, very nice. Well, I think. without doing them down, but it's predicated on if it's a bit like a bicycle, they can make it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, manufacturing. And of, course, and of course, drums are very much like bicycles. Yeah, absolutely. It's just Speaking some hardware. Bicycles, uh, when I was involved with Arbiter, I'm gone a bit off course here, but sure. uh, when I was involved with Arbiter, I got a phone call from a guy in, in the Midwest who said, I really like your flats kit it can um would you think you could adapt it to fit on a bike i said why would you want to put um, a drum kit on a bike and he said because i'm going to south america from the midwest on a bike with the whole band and what's going to happen we're going to get to the gig and we're going to let the audience um ride the bikes uh so that they produce some electricity and your drum kit will be inserted into my bike. So by um, by manipulation, it can be a drum kit. I said, what a great idea. Yeah. And he said, he said, do you want to come? I said, how long are you gone for? And he, he, he said, three years. <laughs> I said, I don't think I've got three years. <laughs> and, and I don't know if he ever got there, but I've always hoped that he did. So that was another use for a drum kit. I mean, I don't, you must, you remember the, the flats kit? They're, they're flat. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. It was an Arbiter product uh, and it was single screw tuning like the Arbiter AT. Well, anyway, he was going to, he was going to mount it to his bicycle. Wow. Uh, and uh, I'm, I hope he made it and uh, God willing, he made it. Yeah. But, what a hell of an endeavor but man three yeah. years <laughs> I've got another one uh, there was this guy who came into drum store uh, he, he came from up north of England and he what he did for a living was he went to the east coast of America hired a Winnebago or something and hit all the mum and pop shops the music shops looking for guitars and so he'd find Rick and Bags. he'd find everything he'd hmm. find treasure trove because it was the sort of era when people wanted new and they didn't want old. You yeah. know, they didn't want a, a blemish on it. And eventually he realized he had some room in, in the Winnebago. So he thought, I could, I could put some drums there. So he discovered some drums. And he came in and uh, there was a WFL in Blue Sparkle with a 13-inch uh, piccolo snare drum with it and with, uh, with beer tap uh, throw off mm -hmm. on it. And he said, uh, he said, are you interested? I said, well, maybe, <laughs> as you do. And he, uh, we, we, we came to an agreement, and I bought it, and John Coglan from uh, Status Quo came in. And John said, what's that? I said, it's a WFL. He said, oh, it's great. How much is it? Uh, can I have it? I said, yes, you can have it. We'll have to work out how much you're going to pay. So he, uh, he took it away, and he lived on the Isle of Man. And he took it away, and... Uh, Years later, what seemed like years later, I said, have you still got that WFL kit, John, when I bumped into it? Oh, I interviewed him. That's right. He said, yeah. I said, where is it? He said, it's in my barn. I said, have you used it? He said, never. I said, you don't need it anymore, do you? He said, no. I said, do you want to swap it? And he said, yeah, go on then. So yeah. I swapped yeah. it for a Yamaha snare drum. And so it then found its way back again into the food chain. And a guy from Ireland in, in one of the Irish, famous Irish bands, bought it. And so it, it found its way out there again. Wow, man. It's just, uh, I like how you said back in the food chain, because it's so true. It's like you're, it's like a car. It's like a barn find that you always hear about. That that literally is a barn find. Um, it, it belongs in the food chain, you know, getting passed along and traded and, and played. It's It's the way it's meant to be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but it's interesting too. I mean, it, it's not that I'm not into guitars because while I was working with Arbiter, um, I used to see a lot of the Fender guys who came over from the West Coast. Arbiter was uh, he was the the concessionaire, so he was he was distributing them, and uh, these guys would talk about Fender guitars. So I learned an awful lot about Fender guitars, and uh, 
I've sort of stored it in the back of my mind. I, I've just written something which I, 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 I thought I was gilding the lily with you, so I didn't send you everything, but I've just written something called Famous Guitars I've Sat Behind. Hmm. So, cool. of course, the drummer's always at the back, looking at the back of the guitar, and sometimes there's a left-handed person, so there's an, a gap to look through, but often there isn't. And um, so I, I started writing about everything that I'd ever sat behind which turns out to be an awful lot. That's fascinating. I think you're, you've got a great uh, mind for looking at interesting topics. I, and I think that, uh, you know, in, in the podcast format, I try to go along those lines of how can we look yeah. at something a little different and pull an hour long episode out of it. And um, so I think we're, we're all cut from the same cloth. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is launching the Tasting Tour 2021. There's going to be tons of cool symbols, members of the Dream Team on site, and the recycling program will be in effect all day at these various awesome music stores around the country. October 2nd, they'll be at Forks Drum Closet in Nashville. October 9th, Melody Music in Bloomington, Indiana. October 16th, Rhythm Traders at Portland, Oregon. And November 6th, they'll be at Rupp Strums in Denver, Colorado. So go out and check it out if Dream will be in your town. Now, I'm looking at your story you sent over here and I, I see an interesting one that I want to talk about which was the um, Trixon snare drum that you acquired which unfortunately oh, right. faced a bit of a uh, sad demise but why don't you tell us about that drum okay now what happened um, I I was an endorser for Trixon Trixon were made in Germany in Hamburg and uh, every now and again I went over there to see them uh, but they there was they asked me to be an endorser, and of course I was flattered. And I'd already had a Trixon kit that I was using with Adam Faith, but they decided they would give me another one. So I said, can I ask you, can you make it so it's imperial size rather than metric size? Because the problem was you couldn't get drum heads for a metric size. Sure. A metric size, that's to say something measured in centimeters rather than in inches. So believe it or don't, and I still can't understand why they did it, they, did, they actually decided they were going to turn their, their drums into uh, imperial sizes, which were inches. Mm. So that's where I began with, uh, uh, with Trixon. And I was in a shop called Drum City, which interestingly enough uh, belonged to Ivor Arbiter. And I was in the shop. And Brian Bennett from The Shadows and various other bands decided. He, I think he he got he didn't have his uh, he didn't have his endorsement with uh, Trixon anymore. I think he was with Ludwig by then. So he bought this drum in, uh, and it sort of immediately went along the counter and, part, and and ended up with me. And Brian had used it for all sorts of of Cliff Richard and The Shadows records. And it had a great sound, and so I was very pleased to get it. Unfortunately, it was um, there was a, 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 a van crash or a bus crash, come to think of it, and everything slid down onto um, onto the guy who was on the back seat sleeping, mm. and uh, it, it killed him. Unfortunately, oh my gosh! But it was yeah. terrible bad luck. It was the edge of a guitar case, broke broke a uh, it broke one of his ribs and put it into. Um, into his lung, unfortunately. Mm. But uh, that the drum was broken, as were several cymbals, which were turned outside, out, inside out. And uh, I have to say, not in a good way. <laughs> they were turned inside <laughs> out in a bad way. So yeah. that was one Trixon uh, kit. And eventually, I, I bought a Speedfire. And that's the, the squashed bass drum. Mm -hmm. And immediately... People wanted to hire it. They wanted to hire it from me. I also bought a Ludwig uh, Vista Light for the same reason. This drum was very interesting because it looked great and it was perfect for videos, and I'll end there. But there is – Fox have just bought out uh, a, a, new, a new version of it, which has got double-headed tom-toms, and it, that really works. And uh, I've played that one, and that really, really works. It's got – Somehow, the 50 years in between it and the latest one, as uh, they've got the technology together to do it. 
So that was my involvement with uh, with Trixon. Yeah, I mean, I think the new stuff, obviously, with Vox, and they have a history going back with you know being the distributor and all that. But I I think they look really really cool. I, I um, it's interesting though to look at some comments online. I've seen some you know people playing them and people look at it and go who don't really know the history. And of course, there's, I mean, it's a bold. It's always been Trixon has always been a bold design company, you know, Trixon slash Vox. Yeah. And some people don't get it. Um, and then maybe it's not for them, but I think it's very cool. The, it's it's very yeah. Salvador Dali esque, you know. Yes, it is. It's like the clocks, isn't it? Or, or the, the watches, the, yeah. the melted watches. Yeah. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah. It's, and uh, the interesting thing is that it shouldn't work, and, and neither should the Telstar. The Tulsa, I mean, drums are predicated on being in a tube, and it, the tube has to have equal size, and it's all it's all modelled these days on the the organ, a church organ, which is, has got uh, which is a, a cylinder, albeit a very long one. So it shouldn't work, and in some cases, <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you know, it's you don't know if you don't try. <laughs> I think it's well, neat too. Have you ever heard of Have you ever heard of art artistry? Uh, uh maybe. I mean, what do you What do you mean artistry? It's an egg shaped drum. Yeah. Okay. I and think it, it stands yeah. on on whatever that part part of the egg is called the the uh, the smaller uh, dome, as it were. Sure. And there was a, there's a shop up in uh, in Sheffield that has one. Now, I have been all over the internet trying to find out more about it and haven't. It's as if, to tell you the truth part, it's as if I'm the only person who's ever seen it. And it, it, it really is weird. And it looks like a science project, what you guys would call a science project. And it, it, it seems to me that it comes, it comes from Kansas City. I don't know why. Or, or from somewhere from Zico's. It looks just like that sort of thing. Yeah, I think but that, that was a nice. was it milestone. So I'm going to I'll, I'll email you an episode I did with Wes Faulkner from Explorers about uh Zico's oh, right. drums Ooh. and he talks about those and that's exactly what I'm what I'm thinking of. So so right. yeah, I'm, it is I'm connected. Glad, I'm glad you've told me because I thought it was just me and I thought maybe it's a bad dream or a dream or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't even tell you there's a photograph of me with one. I can't even tell you if they sounded any good because, I mean, they, they were just too big to do things with, if you see what I mean. You couldn't have sure. hold one in your arms and play it with the other hand. That wasn't possible. Yeah, there's there's some things where maybe they were, um, you know, they're fun to have in your, uh, like, drum room, but you're not going to want to go on a, you know, uh, international tour around the world. It's a cool concept, though, uh, for sure. Yes, it looks good, and and the new one, because I've played it and uh, been been part of the the deal, it it is it it actually sounds rather good, but uh, but that doesn't do away with the fact that you've got to find a very weird case for the bass drum. Yeah, absolutely, and and gosh, it's it's actually I'm kind of as we're talking, trying to do a little googling here, and it's it's very hard to find them. I remember when we did that episode. Um, that Wes kind of sent me in the right direction. So uh, if people want to learn more about that, they can check out that one because it's, I believe, and I'll, f you know, double check this, but I believe what happened was, was Zico sold the name, but wanted to keep making drums and was doing something, um, you know, and I think, I think that's where those came from, but I'll, I'll double check that. But um, man, it's, there's so many cool little stories out there that, that unless we talk to guys like you, they might get lost to history, so I think it's it's exactly, and there is there is um, there is a certain amount of uh, Chinese whispers going on. You know, <laughs> somebody tells somebody something who so tells somebody else, and by it get, by the time it gets back to the original guy, it's completely changed. And uh, I know there are people out there who know more about me than I do, <laughs> and and are prepared to fight me to uh, to get them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> to to get their their thought across. Yeah, I mean that's uh, well. There's also a lot of people who who think they know more than everyone, but um, I try to stay yeah. out of all <laughs> all of that. Yeah, I, I was reading something yesterday, and I thought I mean, the danger is to go into battle and uh, and to say, "Listen, you're wrong, man." Yeah, uh, because that, that that's. But I mean, it's a free country, 
and uh, you yeah. you you have everybody has their views on something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I mean, this is just awesome. So, all right. So, if you had, let's say, all right, you're on the ship. The ship has crashed. Every single drum set you've ever owned is on there for some odd reason. It's going down. You got to save one that you're going to swim to your desert island with out of everything you've ever owned. Let's say drum set um, or snare drum, whatever. But just what is your number one drum? Yeah, I, I can help you. you there. It, it would be the one that got away. Okay. It would be the one that was in Frank Ippolito's shop. Gotcha. Which I neglected to tell you. That's the red uh, Camco. The Camcos, was yeah. $700 wow. in 1970. Now, I've tried to work out how much that would be in, in, in pounds now mm -hmm. or even then. But, I mean, it wasn't expensive. And it, it was just fabulous. Mm. And I didn't buy it. And it, it was five drums. It was everything I, everything I needed. But yeah. anyway, so that one would be nice to resurrect. Uh, snare drum-wise, the... Uh, the super sensitive, the brass one would be the one to have. Sure. You know, I find it, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say psychologically interesting that they're both drums that, that got away. You know what I mean? And I feel the same yeah. way where there's something to that where it's like, um, you know, there's just, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's like you, you kind of, uh, idolize these drums that you can't have and you 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 want them but uh i like that i'd probably be the same way where i'd go oh man that drum set was just perfect I, why did i sell that or why did i get rid of that um it's oh, well, there, yeah well there is a reason for that you have to sell one to move on yeah especially at the beginning of your career i mean all that stuff that we had in the, in the very early 60s uh, um it would find its way into a drum shop and i would come away with another drum yeah. Yep. And then for sure. swap it. Yeah, I think of my my very 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 first drum set was just like a like most people just a toy um kind of uh a percussion plus kit with bass drum and a snare and one tom, no floor, no hi hat, just a yeah. a cheap crash. Do I if I got it back would I do anything with it? No. Would it but I think about that sometimes and I go, "Why did I get rid of that? I sold it for like 70 bucks or something as a kid." Like Yeah. You know, I'd rather have the drums, but all right. So as we kind of wrap up here, what are you playing at the moment right now? What are your current drums you're using? Yeah, um, I well, as, as I said, I no longer have 35 drum kits, which is good. <laughs> I have uh, my son's got a Heyman kit that he uses. I've got um, several. Uh, several I've got an Arbiter AT kit which I felt I should have because I'd put so much uh, work into it. I, I was charging around America with uh, two AT drums in the back of the car, all on my own. You know, it was real grown-up stuff. And prior to that, I'd been to um, – pr prior to doing that stuff, I'd always been following a, tr uh, a tour manager through airports who would tell me where to go. He'd hold his hand up, and, and that, was, that was the sum total of my – uh, of my necessity to um, to be on the road, yeah. so I would be following someone. But uh, I've been with Mapex when when I when I did my trip to um, to Taiwan, I I had a conversation with Mapex, and they took me to lunch. And this proves there's no such thing as a, fr a free lunch. And uh, they were telling me that they had this new drum kit coming out. I said, "Oh, great! I'm looking forward to that." And they said, what did I think of the name Cutlass? Or what did I think of the name, uh, what was the other one they had, Sword or, or something, one of those, Scimitar? Or, and mm -hmm. I said, well, all the, very, all the most successful uh, drum kits, in America at least, ha had the, the maker's name on them. And I said, I think that's what you should be doing. I said, I don't think you need to call it Cutlass. I think that that's a bad thing. So they they called it Mapex. Mm. So I saved. I think I saved them really because I don't think anybody would have taken Cutlass as a. It's a bit like Jugs, isn't it? I mean, if you were a if you were a fourteen year old kid, you would buy a Jugs uh, drum kit or you when it when they were available simply because 
you, you'd be able to boast to your pals about it, but you wouldn't. I doubt you could boast to your pals about a drum kit called Cutlass. No, and here in America, I mean, there's a there's a car called Cutlass that that people think. <laughs> I think Cutlass was taken by you know the Cutlass Supreme, which is like you oh, know, it was uh, a name for a car, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And you know the the Arbiter. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit. I did with Jeff Nichols in, in his previous episode, but I think Ivor Arbiter is such a you know. Uh, maybe he needs a biography episode. He seems to have such a an interesting background. Without offering myself, I'm I'm the man. I um, the reason I got involved with Arbiter AT, the advanced tuning system, is I was writing I, I was um, autobiography. I'm I'm calling it an autobiography because he was telling me what to write. So a lot of that work is done, and the new book when it comes out, which is God willing, I'm touching wood here. It's going to be soon. It's called Crash Bang Wallop, and it's, it, it, it details everything that ever happened with drums in the UK, uh, including Heyman, of course, and all the things that Ivor had, had been responsible for. Wow. So there is something that um, once it comes out, I'm sure you'll be able to, to lift if you want. Oh yeah, and, and please come back and we'll, we'll do an episode on all that and, um, and, and, I mean, I again, you're the kind of guy where it like similar to Rob Cook, where there's I would absolutely love to have you on the show multiple times to cover some of your different articles and things and um, and your your immense knowledge, because we can just pick one and go down the rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, so so this has just been awesome. And and I think um, if Bob, if you have a little bit of time, what I'd love to do is we can do the, the today's bonus episode, which is for people on Patreon, where they can contribute a couple bucks by going to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a button there to click but i'd love to hear uh there we can hop over and talk about your awesome new documentary count me in um which i just thoroughly enjoyed and and i you know somehow from doing research and getting ready for this interview like i said i knew you were in it i wanted to talk about that but i really didn't realize your level of involvement of being the producer which is obviously uh, pretty yeah it, it, it was a lot of work and but I mean it started out as I said in 1987 when I began to do it and um, uh, it, it for, for all sorts of reasons it didn't come out and uh, also no I don't think anybody was spending money on anything at the time yeah and uh, it was it, 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 it's I wanted to, to do and maybe one day this will come out. I wanted to do a much broader thing on on the drum itself and how we used to use it in uh, uh, in battle and the and we used it for signalling yep. in battle in the battle. Now, how could that be? We've got all these cannons going off around and lots of shouting and bashing of sabers together. Uh, and I I thought it was a it would be great to go into that. And there's a story about Napoleon. And Napoleon is at the Battle of Waterloo, of course. And somebody has captured a drummer boy uh, who's probably 10 years or 11 years old. And, and they're about to shoot him as a spy. And the guy uh, kicks up a fuss and says, I'm not a spy, I'm a drummer. So he didn't have his drum with him. So um, Napoleon said, uh, well, if you if you're a drummer, play the command to advance, and he went into da 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 da, which is the command to advance, but certainly for your army and our army. And they said, right, play the command to retreat. And the the drummer boy said, there's no such uh, no such command in the British army. And uh, Napoleon laughed because there isn't. And uh, the guy the kid walked off. But it was uh, so I wanted to write about those things and about the fact that yeah, it's it's uncool to shoot a drummer boy in a war. Yeah, it's it is. bad form. Yeah. So they, it was as if they had the chance to not get killed. You know, they had a get out of jail free card. So all of those sort of things I, I'm interested in writing about. Hmm. Because the, as you said right at the beginning, there's a lot more drums than meets the eye. It's a very, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, it is about how it, how it how it worked, and uh, the whole signalling with a drum. 
Yeah. Because we, we touched on that with, I suppose, uh, if I had my uh, WFL with me on my desert island, I would play. You'd be playing retreat, like, get me off this damn island. Give me, <laughs> I need to retreat off the oh, island. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, thank you again to Maddie Roberts um, for uh, connecting us. I just think it's it's awesome. And and people can find his percussion discussion episodes at uh, you can find them on, on YouTube at North Wales Drum Promotions is his YouTube channel. Again, that's North Wales Drum Promotions. Um, and. Everyone can look forward to I'm, I'm sure we'll have Bob back in the next couple months um, because he is uh, quite an inventor as well, um, which real quick, Bob, why don't you just tell us some of the inventions so we can look forward to hearing about him more in depth in, in a future episode? OK, well, like everybody in the uh, in the 70s, I had roto toms. Yeah. But I always thought that the roto tom could do more. Of course, you can tune it up by uh by messing around by turning the head, but you couldn't um, you couldn't play anything because you only had one hand to hit with. So I invented a foot pedal, which turned well. According to Remo, it turned it into a musical instrument where it hadn't been. So I was very pleased with that. So that's one of them. Cool. Um, I invented um, some uh, an electronic drum called hum drum, and believe it or not, it was in Tupperware. So I'm sure everybody knows what Tupperware is. I hope. Yeah. Anyway. So it looked right from the word go. So that was another one. I I have uh, a piece of string with a uh, strong string, and it has a, a key on the other end, a drum key. And there's a knot for how high the stool is. There's a knot for how high the snare drum is. There's a knot for how high the toms are and the ride cymbal and the crash cymbal. So it's that long, a piece of string. And, uh, and so the knots signify how to set up anybody's drum kit. And Matty and I were talking about that because he saw me using it. He said, oh, I was just so impressed because <laughs> it's so simple. You feel kit sharing. You know, you can change the you can change the heights and make it playable for you within milliseconds. Genius. So um, that's, that's another one that I invented. I invented the threaded drum key. I saw something from a Modern Drummer this week about drum keys of the, it seems to be drum keys of the stars, but they've missed out on the idea of having a thread inside the square bit that goes on top of your cymbal stand. So it's always there. So I invented that for, uh, for Zildjian, and then the, uh, the schism began, and uh, it found its way to, it found its way to Sabian, and now it's found its way to Evans. I'm not sure how that worked. Hmm. But of course, patents don't last forever. I love the string. I mean, that's just genius. It kind of reminds me of like how you uh, like people in their garage will have a string coming down with a tennis ball. And when the tennis ball touches your window, they know to stop their car. It kind of reminds <laughs> me of that, where it's like it's an <laughs> yeah. easy, simple way to just set your drum set up. And, and, and that's just yeah. awesome. Well, I'd like to make a fortune from it, but it's it's only a piece of string. And how long is a piece of string? Uh, I mean, indeed. I don't know. I can't. I don't know if you can patent a piece of string. Unfortunately. Well, it's, interestingly enough, I've I've explored drum patents. It's really you need a, you need an afternoon, but you find out things that that you didn't know. Like the the double foot pedal was uh, was so long ago that it it, it you can't believe it. Uh, and things like there's a piece of a piece of cable that goes from your hi hat around your your stool. And back to the bass drum on the right hand side, yeah, it means that the, it can't go forward. Yeah, and somebody's got a patent on that. Somebody's equally got <laughs> this is hilarious. Got a patent on a drum machine or an electronic drum kit that you power uh, by pedaling. So you're sitting on a on a an elect, uh, on a bike, and you're you're pedaling it to make the electricity so that you can practice. Wow. The problem is your feet are out of the equation. Which, yeah. But, it's like an old sewing machine or something or like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like the old singer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Man. Yeah. We need to do an episode on, on wacky drum inventions, which I don't think there's Hey, but like, I gotta say, I think it's awesome just to come up with something and put out in the world and, and for everyone yeah. who actually literally went through the process of creating a patent. I mean, that takes money and time. So 
more power yep. to them. Um, well, you could get a th- you can get a, a patent on anything for a thousand dollars, and it doesn't it doesn't seem to matter whether somebody has already got a patent on it. I Jeez. mean, unless it's really, really the same. Yeah. If you if you deviate a little bit, you could you'll probably get away with it. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. Well, Bob, is there anything where you want to like direct people to a website or somewhere where they can look and no, uh, keep there, up there with what you're? There are several books out there. The, the, there's the 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 uh, the complete Simmons drum book, which was the first book that I wrote. I don't know. You probably wouldn't know this, but I started out writing for a magazine called Beat Instrumental. And then moved from beat instrumental uh, to international musician, which was, was available in America. And then I moved to Melody Maker, and so I've I've been hanging around that sort of part of the of the the music world for years and years. Uh, and I really like it. It's good fun, and uh, and I get to learn things that uh, I wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. But I mean, that's it. you know, you and I discover discussed that you've got to. Got to write these things down, otherwise uh, they'll get lost. Yeah, or talk about them on a podcast such as this. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Well, and and, uh, and again, like I said, everyone check out Count Me In on Netflix, which uh, I'm excited to learn more about from Bob here momentarily on the bonus episode. So, anyway, on yeah. that note, Bob, thank you so much for sharing all this information. Um, and I think I think it'd be cool. Maybe other people can send me a message, and I'll share them online. So find me on social media and send me what your Desert drums would be maybe leave it at about oh, three yeah. of them, and I'll share it with yeah. I'll share it with Bob too because I think he'll get a kick out of seeing that. And uh, yeah, so send me your stuff. Um, find me on social media. Most people probably follow me. There's a pretty uh, you know big group of drummers who meet on the Drum History Podcast uh, social media. So send me your Desert Island drums, and uh, we'll talk about it later. But yeah, thank you, Bob, for being here. This has just okay. been an absolute pleasure. You're very welcome, Bob. I really enjoyed it. But I need a cup of coffee now, (laughs) as probably you do. (laughs) Yes. All right. Thank you, Bob. Okay, man. We'll talk. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.